Garcia Moreno, President of Ecuador, 1821-1875, to by Reverend Father Augustine Berth, translated by Lady Herbert. The Anti-Revolutionary Crusade, 1857-1869, to Chapter 1, The Reawakening of the Nation, 1857. Whilst Garcia Moreno was preparing himself in exile for the great work which God had destined he should accomplish, his unhappy country was being daily more and more ruined and degraded. Urbina looked upon the church as his greatest enemy and began by expelling the holy bishop of Guayaquil and substituting one of his own creatures. Naturally, the Holy See refused to confirm this appointment. And Urbina, thinking that the time was not yet come for an open schism, contented himself with brutally recalling the Marquis de Lorenzana, who was his charge d'affaires at Rome. Then began a regular war against priests and clergy, both regular and secular. The convents were turned into barracks. The most frightful scenes took place in the colleges and seminaries. All ecclesiastical establishments were secularized. The primary schools abolished. The university ruined by the fact that the students were allowed to take their degrees without study or examination, according to a new law passed by Urbina. In fact, he governed the people of Ecuador as slaves or helots. Whilst the provinces of the interior groaned under his iron rule, his two satraps, Robles and Franco terrorized the seacoast. There were daily assassinations of officers, judges, and even priests. The brave General Campos fell under their blows. Robberies, murders, and crimes of all sorts were the order of the day. To fill his empty coffers, Urbina had invented a new crime which he called Florianism. Whenever he wanted more money, his organs pretended that a fresh revolutionary movement had been organized by the partisans of Flores, and forced contributions were exacted from the people, nominally to pay for an increase in the army, which, it is needless to add, was never carried out. If anyone resisted, he was thrown into prison, and his goods sold by auction. Lord and master of the country, he tried to sell a portion of it, the islands of Galapagos, to the United States, under the plea of their possessing large depots of guano. Fortunately, the islands themselves protested that no guano was to be found there. The contract was broken, and three million piastres lost to Urbina, whose nefarious project was thus made public. People will ask, perhaps, how such a state of things could exist with a constitutional and parliamentary government. It was because both chambers were created by Urbina himself. When the electors ventured to bring forward some honest and conscientious deputy, Urbina instantly invalidated his election, and if any resistance were offered, the autocrat exiled his opponents to Peru, to New Granada, and even to the savage plans of Napo. Neither sex, age, nor rank were spared. Ladies of high birth and even young girls were thrown into prison or confined in convents for political reasons. As for the press, their mission consisted in offering incense to their master, who paid them well. The Democratic declared open war against priests, nobles, and the rich, while the Joven liberal endeavor to sap the foundations of all social and religious order. When Urbina's presidency was on the point of expiring, some of the more courageous of the citizens started a new paper called El Expectador in the hopes of vindicating the rights of religion in their country. This brought down upon them the rage of Urbina and of his satellites, and a decree of expulsion against them was instantly decided upon. Old men, soldiers, even generals were dragged out of their beds in the middle of the night and transported to Panama or to the deserts of Napo. Once more silence reigned in Quito, but it was a silence of despair. This razia of conservatives took place just before the presidential election, 
which was accordingly carried in favor of Urbina's favorite general, Robles. In order to secure it, the prisons were momentarily opened and the unhappy victims restored to liberty. But there was no change in the policy of the government. There was the same persecution of the church, the same profanation of her temples, the same universal bankruptcy, in fact, the reign of evil in all its horrors. At the end of 1856, the friends of Garcia Moreno asked for a safe conduct pass for one who had been so long exiled from his family and country. Robles granted it, thinking therefore to gain the hearts of the people of Quito, and little thinking of the effect of his return. Hardly had Garcia Moreno set foot once more in his native country than every possible honor was heaped upon him. The municipality of Quito appointed a malcade or supreme judge. Then the rectorship of the university, having fallen vacant, he was nominated to this important post so as to raise public education, which had fallen to the lowest levels. The Faculty of Sciences existed only in name. It had neither professors, nor laboratory, nor instruments of any sort. Garcia Moreno presented the university with a magnificent chemical laboratory, which he had brought from Paris for himself, and undertook to teach that almost unknown science. His pupils were amazed at the extent of his knowledge, and in addition to private lessons, he gave public lectures, in which he showed the application of the science to agriculture and commerce. But he never lost sight of the great object he had at heart, namely the deliverance of his people. And in May 1857, a fresh election was to be held for the members of Congress. He resolved to re-enter the Senate with some of his old political friends and to reorganize once more the Conservative Party. For this purpose, he started a new paper, the Union National, in which he pointed out the scandals of the government and called upon the people at the electoral urns to decide the future of the Republic. The people at last, roused by his impassioned harangues, woke from their long lethargy. The young men especially prepared to struggle with energy for the good cause and for the heroic leader. On the other hand, there was no species of infamy to which the government did not resort to intimidate and coerce the electors. These proceedings were, one by one, mercilessly exposed by the Union National, and at last the day of battle arrived. Government spies were placed at every voting place to watch the electors. Soldiers lined the streets, insulting the citizens and threatening them with the wrath of a certain Colonel Patrick Vivero, who was the terror of the country. At last, some of the young men, of the best families of Quito, determined to place themselves in squadrons before the soldiers and protect the electors by force of arms. There was sharp fighting on both sides, but in the end the government was beaten, and Garcia Moreno, with a considerable number of his political friends, were triumphantly elected. Urbina understood that this defeat was a mortal blow. Henceforth, he would have to reckon not only with a powerful opposition in the chambers, but with a people whose patience was exhausted and who had found out that their strength lay in union. Four years ago, he had laid violent hands on the senator of Guayaquil and exiled him to Peru. But who would dare arrest the senator of Quito? On September 15, 1857, Amidst the frantic cheers of the whole population, Garcia Moreno took his seat, surrounded by his colleagues, each and all determined to free their country from its tyrants. Parliamentary Opposition, 1857-1859 The legislative session was opened by one of those official messages, which would have excited nothing but derision, had not the people become used to similar effusions. Robles allowed himself to be deceived by the assurances of some of his creatures among the deputies, and believed that, once the electoral excitement was over, the people would remain passive under the yoke. But that was not Garcia Moreno's intention. All the ministerial proposals, which, under the name of constitutional reforms, 
were only intended to satisfy the vengeance of the executive, were piteously rejected. In the debate on the budget, he insisted on an account being rendered of the expenditure, and expressed himself with such indignation against the squanderers of the public treasury that the report of his speech was suppressed in the official papers. He intervened also in three matters of capital importance. The first concerned the capitation tax of three piastres ahead on the Indians, which had been frequently denounced as iniquitous by the legislature, but which had never been abolished, on the plea of the bankruptcy of the treasury. The radicals pleaded, as usual, for its continuance, while shedding crocodile tears over the misery of the poor Indians. But Garcia Moreno indignantly replied, Why so much discussion on a question of simple justice and humanity? If this tax be manifestly contrary to law and equity, why defer its abolition? I will tolerate no delay in this matter. The tax was abolished to the delight of the whole country. The second question was that of public education. Garcia Moreno, having proposed a new organic law, elaborated with the greatest care after his European experiences. But he was defeated in spite of his eloquence by the obstinate resistance of the government and the penury of the treasury. Before voting sums for the education of youth, the soldiers must have their pay and the public functionaries their salaries. It was a hopeless status quo until the disorder in the finances could be remedied. Garcia Marina succeeded better, however, in another matter, which was the closing of the Masonic Lodges, which had been surreptitiously opened in Guayaquil. He spoke against them with such eloquence that the motion was voted by a large majority, and in the following terms. The Catholic religion, being that of all the citizens, and the only one recognized by the Constitution, it is impossible, without grave danger, to admit the creation of irreligious societies, and as, by negligence or connivance, certain secret societies have been introduced into Ecuador of a decidedly anti-religious character, the Congress decrees the dissolution of the Masonic Lodges and all other associations disapproved of by the Church. Unhappily, through the intrigues of the government and their assertion that these secret societies had no irreligious character, this law remained a dead letter. Except the abolition of the Indian tax, the session of 1857 had been absolutely sterile from a legislative point of view. But morally, the influence Garcia Marino exercised in the country was immense. The destruction of all higher education the peculations in the treasury, the subservience of the government to the Freemasons. All this had been so ably exposed by him that the anger and scorn of the people against their tyrants knew no bounds. Foreign difficulties came to add to other complications. In order to raise money, large tracts of land had been ceded to English and American immigrants, against which Peru energetically protested declaring that the alienated territory belonged to them. Urbina, who had never forgiven General Castilla, the president of Peru, for having given an asylum to Flores, revenged himself by insulting and finally dismissing the Peruvian ambassador, Cavaro, who had come from Lima to settle the frontier question. Castilla replied by an ultimatum, in which he exacted the readmission of the ambassador, menacing, in case of refusal, to blockade the port of Guayaquil. This happened in 1858, and gave Urbina a pretext for fresh conscription and exactions of money, which were carried out with such injustice and cruelty as to rouse the whole population. The dissolution of the chambers and the removal of the seat of government to Guayaquil were openly discussed. Congress reassembled, and again Garcia Marino pointed out in the strongest language the dangers which menaced the country. After two days' discussion, the whole town shared in the alarm of the Senate. Urbina, in a fury, gave orders to a body of Taras 
to go to the bar of the house and arrest Garcia Moreno in the midst of the senators. Fortunately, the plot got wind. A large body of young men devoted to Garcia Moreno implored him not to go to the house the following day, as this band of brigands were determined to assassinate him. He replied that never would he draw back before such vile criminals, or in fact before any danger. So at the usual hour he went to the old convent of St. Bonaventura, where the Senate held its meetings. On his arrival he found a large body of young patriots from all parts of the town who had come to defend him in case of need. They were not useless. The Taras, at their post, sword in hand and with menaces on their lips, were firmly watching the proceedings of the members. Garcia Moreno quickly rose and resumed the debate of the day before with greater vigor than ever. After having pointed out the iniquities of the government and the way its members were despising the law, the constitution, and the legislative assembly, he suddenly stopped and pointing to the Taras below the bar, denounced, in a voice which thrilled through the whole house, the project of Urbina against the national representatives, and also the baseness of those soldiers who had consented to act as assassins. His burning words had such an effect that the unhappy Taras left the Senate trembling and ashamed. The retraction of the powers previously granted to the government was voted by an immense majority. After the sitting was over, the Taras gathered round the doors, determined to lay hands on Garcia Moreno as he came out. But the young patriots were before them. They surrounded their hero, overwhelming him with congratulations, and conducted him in triumph to his house. After this defeat, Urbina and Robles thought it would be easier to intimidate the lower house. During the debate, Robles fulminated a new message against the opposition. The soldiers mounted guard, sword in hand, by the houses of the hostile deputies, threatening them with death if they resisted the will of the tyrants. But nothing could induce the majority to allow these men to continue their arbitrary proceedings, and the withdrawal of their powers was voted unanimous. At the same time, the Congress proved that however much they might be opposed to the despotism of the two dictators, they were quite willing to prepare for the national defense. At the beginning of November, the news reached Quito of the blockade of Guayaquil. The two chambers instantly offered their concurrence to the government to vote the resources and men and money necessary for the struggle. But that would not have suited Durvina who was determined to free himself from all control. Not daring any longer to threaten to dissolve the house by force, he resolved to effect his purpose by stratagem. Eleven of the deputies were his creatures, and he persuaded them to desert their posts, and thus make all deliberation impossible. From the lack of the number of voters required by the Constitution, the house was counted out, and Urbina instantly dissolved the chambers, and announced the formation of a new authority entitled The Supreme Direction of the War. Having appointed Urbina General-in-Chief of the Army, Robles, the dictator, started for Guayaquil, putting out a pompous address to the nation, in which he announced that he was going to exercise the powers which had been confided to him by the people. Thus, after having mocked the people by dismissing their national representatives, he flattered himself he could act with impunity. He forgot that he could not carry out a foreign war while leaving behind him an infuriated nation, but God blinds those whom he has determined to abandon. The National Rising, 1859 it would be difficult to describe the exasperation of the people after the coup d'etat of the government against the chambers. Deputies and senators registered an indignant protest against the dissolution of Congress, declaring the new dictatorship illegal and unconstitutional. The Municipal Council of Quito 
equally protested against the abandonment of their capital and the transfer of the government to Guayaquil. These indignant remonstrances became known to all the people through the heroic devotion of the printer Valencia, who thus braved the wrath of the two despots and soon felt the consequences of their fury. He and doctors Herrera and Mestanza were condemned to exile and conveyed under a strong escort to the plain of Cunchichamba, where Valencia was tied to a tree and shot. Even the Democrats stigmatized this act of unwarrantable cruelty. One man after another, eminent for his virtues, talents, or bravery, was thrown into prison and either exiled or murdered in cold blood. Garcia Moreno had the narrowest escape and had only time to get on board a trading vessel bound for Peru. At last, the most influential men in the army felt that the moment was come when they must fight for their homes and country like the brave Indians of old. A tremendous earthquake on the 22nd of March added to the confusion and terror of the inhabitants. On the 4th of April, the troops, under the direction of General Maldonado, declared open war against the dictators. At 11 o'clock at night, Colonel Darquia, with 20 well-armed men, entered Robles's house, whom he found playing at cards with his friend, Franco, and arrested him without anyone offering any resistance. Unhappily, however, Franco, who had escaped, came back, pistol in hand, and blew out Darquia's brains. Maldonado, instead of being at hand with his men, had encamped himself on a height, and hearing of the death of Darquia, he lost courage and entered into negotiations with Robles so that the troops returned to their quarters, save five hundred of them, who took the opportunity to desert. This check only strengthened the hands of the tyrants. But all of a sudden, news came of a popular insurrection in Quito. On January 1st, 1859, a troop of young men surrounded the barracks and found the military quite prepared to fraternize with them. Espinel, who was vice-governor, ran with some of his radicals to try and preach submission, but found himself powerless. The overthrow of the government was declared amidst wild cries of delight, and a provisional government was formed, consisting of three members, Garcia Marino, Carrion, and Gomez de la Torre. The movement spread rapidly throughout the provinces, and very soon enthusiastic letters of approval arrived from all sides. Only Guayaquil and Cuenca remained with the two dictators, and this only because intimidated by their troops. A courier was dispatched to Garcia Marino, telling him of his election and imploring him to hasten to their aid. With incredible difficulties, he managed to escape the ambuscades of his enemies, and arrived at Quito on the 1st of May, where he was received as a savior, and instantly set to work to organize the revolt and to influence the ardor of the patriots by the following thrilling words. Down with the tyrants, wherever they reign, human intelligence is enchained, the laws violated, the nation martyred, and the republic on the brink of an abyss. A few days later, Garcia Marino exchanged his pen for a sword. Robles was advancing with twelve or fifteen hundred men towards the capital, and a small band of volunteers hurried to meet him, who clamored for Garcia Marino to lead them. He was not a soldier, but had been initiated into all the details of military service. Still, it required a courage like his own to go and meet disciplined troops, with a handful of men, badly armed and utterly undisciplined, who had been gathered together hastily to repel the enemy. On the 3rd of June, he found Urbina encamped at Tambuco, in an admirable position, with a strong natural defense, while his poor recruits were in the open and exposed to every shot. The battle began at 10 o'clock in the morning and lasted till 4 in the evening. Garcia Marino and his men showed prodigies of valor, but in vain. Their defeat was complete. 
The greater part of them were left dead on the battlefield. The survivors fled to the mountains, where they were tracked and hunted down by the enemy without mercy. In this terrible fight, Garcia Moreno showed a tenderness of heart equal to his bravery. Without the smallest concern for his personal safety, he flew from one wounded man to another, not being able to bear the idea of leaving any of these poor fellows to the tender mercies of Urbina's soldiery. When he felt at last that he must fly so as not to fall into the hands of the enemy, he found himself alone without a horse, his own having been killed under him, and exposed every moment to being captured by the hostile troops. At that moment, Colonel Ventimilla rode up, mounted on a good horse, who instantly jumped off and insisted on Garcia Moreno's taking it. No, exclaimed Garcia Moreno. What will you do if I leave you here? What does that matter? Nobly replied the colonel. There are plenty of Ventimillas, and only one Garcia Moreno. After which, with a gesture which admitted of no reply, he forced Garcia Moreno to mount in the gallop from the spot. Footnote. Ignacio Ventimilla was president of the Republic from 1876 to 1881. Quantum mutatus abido. End footnote. A few days later he arrived at Quito with a few officers and soldiers who had escaped from the disaster of Tambuco. But this defeat, instead of discouraging the people, had only increased their patriotism. They received him with a ringing of bells and every demonstration of joy to show him that in spite of his defeat, they still looked upon him as the only savior of their country. The moment, however, was most critical. In a conference with his colleagues, Garcia Moreno was of opinion that, the creation of an army being impossible, they must have recourse to diplomacy. He proposed, therefore, to return to Peru and obtain the cooperation of the President Castilla against Robles and Urbina. The provisional government, in the meantime, was to be transferred to Ibarra. This being agreed to, Garcia Marina started for Lima, but found that Castilla, though very courteous and civil, was unwilling to assist his unfortunate countrymen without a portion of the territory of Ecuador being ceded to Peru an odious bargain to which no man of honor could accede. In despair at the failure of these negotiations, Garcia Marina resolved to address himself to the patriotism of General Franco, proposing to him to abandon the cause of these miserable dictators, and with his army to join the provisional government. He pointed out to him the terrible condition of Quito, which had again been occupied by Urbina, and tried to make him understand that continued civil war must be the result of the present state of things. Franco perfectly understood what Garcia Moreno wanted, but he had a secret plan of his own, which was to get rid of Urbina and Robles and become himself the president of Ecuador. A month later, on the 21st of August, it was announced that in consequence of a convention between Castillo and Franco, the maritime provinces were determined to form a new government. Urbina and Robles hastened to Guaranda to find means to avert the blow, but they were about to lose a power which they had so long and so shamelessly abused. No sooner had Robles left the capital than the fresh revolution broke out. Carvajal, with his little army, had beaten the government troops at Ibarra, and was marching to the rescue of Quito. On the 4th of September, in consequence of fresh aggressions on the part of the governor, the population rose as one man. Armed with guns, stones, and sticks, the insurgents attacked the artillery barracks. Women threw sand and ashes at the eyes of the soldiers, who, yielding to numbers, were obliged to lay down their arms after a bloody struggle. A few days later, Carvajal arrived at Quito with his victorious troops, and the provisional government was once more re-established. The gates of the capital being thus closed to Urbina and Robles, 
they tried to take refuge in Guayaquil. But on the 6th of November, General Franco convoked the citizens of that town to a fresh election for the presidency. Without taking any account of the provinces of the interior, and in spite of the rule that a vote of this nature demanded an absolute majority, he contented himself with 161 votes against 160 spontaneously given to Garcia Moreno, and proclaimed himself the Supreme Chief of the Republic. Whilst this theatrical farce was going on, Urbina and Robles, caught between two fires, remained at Guaranda. It was impossible to make a step backwards without falling into the hands of the patriots of Quito, or a step forwards without encountering Franco's troops. Nothing remained to these two infamous men but to leave Ecuador as soon as possible. Robles took refuge in Chile on board a vessel coming from Panama, where Urbina escaped on a French ship. The terrible tyranny they had exercised over their countrymen had lasted for eight years, but we shall see later on that they had by no means given up hope of a return to power. The Drama of Riobamba, 1859 Ecuador was delivered from the twins, but the last surviving member of the infamous triumvirate, the savage Franco, remained and Garcia Moreno's whole energies were now turned to accomplishing the difficult task of sending him to rejoin his two accomplices. It was true that the provincial government represented almost the whole nation, but how was it possible to defeat and disarm the usurper? With a little army of Carvajal and a handful of volunteers, without guns or any of the munitions of war, how could they hope to conquer the disciplined troops of Franco, assisted by five or six thousand Peruvians, and the cannons of the squadron which blockaded Guayaquil? The experience of Tambuco had proved to Garcia Moreno the powerlessness of the greatest bravery against numbers and military skill. He began, therefore, by creating an army and sending the volunteers to have their military drill under experienced officers. Then he made an appeal to the whole country to raise a sufficient sum to maintain these men and to obtain horses, provisions, and all that was needed for the new army. But the apparently insurmountable difficulty was the want of arms. They had neither rifles or cannons nor ammunition. All these things were in Franco's hands. Despairing of obtaining any from abroad, Garcia Marina determined to manufacture them on the spot. In the hacienda of Chilo, there was a large cotton manufactory belonging to a friend of his, M. Juan Arguer. He transformed this into an arsenal and a cannon foundry. Thanks to his extraordinary and universal knowledge, he succeeded in procuring the necessary materials, and with no other assistant than the simple mechanician, he managed to turn out of this yard rifles of a rare perfection, and even cannons of a great size, like the Chimborazo and Cotopaxi, which for certainty of aim rivaled the best from European foundries, then powder, balls, shells, cartridges, and all the necessary ammunition. But what fearful labor all this entailed, and what an amount of study to calculate with mathematical precision the different sites required to train the workmen in every branch of this new art, and to overlook himself every operation. All day he was at his foundry, all night in his study, seeking the solution of the many difficult problems which suggested themselves in this new manufacturer. But his prodigious activity and his iron constitution seemed to defy all fatigue. Once, when he had just returned to Quito from a forced march from Guayaquil, he heard that the works of Chilo had been closed. Without stopping to give himself a moment's rest or food, he called for his horse and galloped the four leagues which separated the capital from Chilo, where he instantly set all the men to work again. Another time, after having made a long and perilous journey of forty-eight hours across the mountains, 
he arrived among his workmen in such a state of exhaustion that he dropped asleep as he got down from his horse and did not wake again for a long time. I can conquer hunger and thirst, he exclaimed afterwards, but not sleep. This was his great regret, for the twenty-four hours were much too short for the work he had undertaken. While preparing for war, however, he did not despair of arriving at a pacific solution of the difficulty. One day he wrote to Peta, where in a last interview with Castilla, he showed him his own proclamation, in which he had said that he did not make war against the people of Ecuador, but only against their tyrants. But Castilla formally demanded the ceding of a portion of the territory of Ecuador, on which condition alone he would recall his troops. Garcia Moreno indignantly rejected this proposal, and then tried to make one more appeal to the patriotism of Franco, pointing out to him the indelible stain which would attach itself to his name if he sold his country to the enemy and offering even to give up to him his place in the provisional government. Franco feigned to accept, but to prove his sincerity, Garcia Maria proposed to him to bring his forces to Guayaquil to commence hostilities against Castilla. Caught in his own net, Franco positively refused and broke off the conference. Having thus exhausted all pacific means, Garcia Moreno started again for Quito to review the troops stationed on the road. Hardly had he quitted Guayaquil than a troop of villains, armed with poignards and revolvers, set off to follow him, but he managed to elude them by the extraordinary celerity of his movements. At each station the assassins found he was ahead of them but after escaping from this danger, he fell into another, which threatened to be still more perilous. After Urbina's flight, some of his troops had remained at Riobamba, and Franco, who knew their faithless and indisciplined character, determined to bribe them to revolt and betray their chief. Garcia Moreno, after having visited the troops at Coranda, arrived on the 7th of November at Riobamba, intending to rest there for a few days. But in the middle of the night, his frightened servants rushed up to him to say that the soldiers had revolted and their generals had declared against the provisional government, and especially against the chief. Calm and silent, Garcia Moreno was reflecting on what measures to take when the commandant, Cabero, presented himself with all the insolence of a rebel and ordered him to give up his position. Never, replied Garcia Moreno, and as Cavero proceeded to threaten him, Enough, he cried. You may take my life, but you will never conquer my will. At a sign from Cavero, Captain Palacios arrested the intrepid representative of supreme power and threw him into prison, announcing to him that if he persisted in his resolution, the morrow would be his last day. The officers and soldiers then gave themselves up to every sort of debauchery and excess, pillaging the different quarters of the town and leaving only a few sentinels at the door of the prison. Garcia Marino's first thought was to commend his soul to God, feeling sure that these men would not hesitate to assassinate him without mercy. But then, with great calmness, he began to think what he could do to prolong a life which was not, he felt, useless to his country. From a garret window, looking on the street, he saw his guards enviously, watching their more fortunate companions, and he justly presumed that their love of drink and hope of plunder would induce them, before long, to desert their posts and disobey their orders, in order to share in the spoils. At this moment, a servant of one of his faithful friends managed to get near him for a moment and to whisper to him that if he could only unscrew one of the bars of the window, he could easily scale the low wall of the prison, while at the gate of the city a horse ready saddled was prepared for his flight. "'Tell your master,' replied Garcia, "'that I will leave this prison not by the window, but by the door through which I entered it.' His provisions were realized. 
the guards dispersed one after the other leaving him to be watched by one sentinel only within the walls after a few moments of prayer and reflection garcia moreno drew near to this man and asked him in the tone of a master or rather of a judge to whom did you take an oath of fidelity to the chief of the state replied the soldier trembling the only legitimate chief of the state is myself replied garcia moreno you owe therefore to me alone obedience and fidelity your officers are rebels and perjurers are you not ashamed to help them to these acts of violence and to betray thus your god and your country the soldier struck with compunction threw himself on his knees and asked his pardon i will forgive you he replied if you will obey me and do your duty a few minutes later with the aid of this man he had left the prison and accompanied by a faithful general had escaped from riobamba and galloped on to calpi where he had already summoned some of his best men to meet him an hour later he found himself at calpi with fourteen brave men determined to follow him to the death without giving them an instant to think he retraced his steps to riobamba determined to capture the rebels and resume the command of the troops when they returned to the town amidst the universal pillage and destruction of the houses a dead silence reigned after the orgies of the night some of the chiefs had gone off with their booty the rest including palacios the leader of the revolt were sunk in a drunken sleep without a moment's hesitation garcia moreno seized him with the principal bandits and dragging them into the square held a council of war palacios appeared at first too drunk to realize his position condemned to death he answered with insolence but the severe voice of garcia moreno recalled the reality to him you have half an hour to prepare yourself for death he exclaimed and not a moment more he sent for a priest to reconcile these guilty men with god but palacios refused its ministry and at the time appointed the rebel fell under the balls of the soldiers several other officers shared the same fate one captain only was spared one of the principal ladies of the town having asserted that he had not shared in the rebellion but had been hiding in her house during the sacking of the town garcia moreno who was always just at once granted him a free pardon the death of their leaders terrified the soldiers who were too thankful to be allowed to return to their old commanders garcia moreno then resolved to pursue those who had escaped with their spoils to macha with his fourteen devoted followers he arrived in that little town at midnight the brigands having fallen asleep on the galleries which surrounded the square plaza their guns piled beside them and sentinels being placed at the end of each avenue sword in hand garcia moreno advanced the night being rainy and dark and attached the first sentry who would have fled but was thrust through with a bayonet surprised in their sleep and in the dark the rebels fancied themselves surrounded by a large number of troops a few escaped but eighty of them disarmed and garroted were led back to riobamba by garcia's men with orders to shoot the first who should attempt to escape garcia marina now thought himself master of the position when another body of troops approached a furious fight went on in the dark many were killed and wounded yield brigands exclaimed garcia moreno his voice was recognized and both sides discovered that they had made a fatal mistake these fresh troops were not rebels but faithful soldiers who had come in hot haste from mbato to fight the rebels of riobamba after having mourned the deaths of these faithful friends garcia moreno with a strong reinforcement went on in pursuit of the rebels he succeeded at last in capturing three hundred 
who, after their term of imprisonment was over, were once more incorporated in the standing army. The remainder fled to the mountains, and there lived as brigands, which was, in fact, their habitual trade. Thus ended this terrible episode in Garcia Moreno's life, which, but for the providence of God, might have had a most disastrous termination. The genius and bravery of one man had triumphed over treachery, a rebel army and persistent bad luck. Exhausted with fatigue and still more heartbroken at the thought of the state of anarchy of his country, Garcia Marina returned to Quito, there to organize the preparations for a campaign which had become inevitable against the pretended head of the Republic in Guayaquil. Negotiations and Battles, 1859-1860 Whilst Garcia Moreno was disarming the rebels of Riobamba, Castilla made his appearance at the mouth of the Guayas with 6,000 men, whom Franco permitted to disembark, and thus give the key of his country to Peru. Then he announced a convention with Castilla to settle an exchange of territory, to which he had the audacity to invite the members of the provisional government of Quito. Garcia Moreno saw clearly that no amount of negotiation with these two thieves would prevent the dismemberment of Ecuador. He seriously contemplated, therefore, placing the Republic under the protection of France, and for that purpose letters were exchanged between himself and the French minister. But this project seemed an impossible one to the other members of the provisional government, so that, wishing to exhaust all pacific means in their power, they sent two of their members, Avilas and Gomez de la Torre, armed with full powers to negotiate with Franco, but under the express condition and no way to compromise the integrity of their territory or the independence of their nation. An equitable convention was drawn up, the terms of which were accepted by Franco, but indignantly rejected by Castilla, who had not brought his six thousand men for nothing to Guayaquil, and told General Franco that he had been the dupe of his enemies. Upon this, Franco flew into a violent rage, refused to sign the convention, and threw the two ambassadors into prison. They were only released by the intervention of the English charge d'affaires, and on condition that they should leave the city in six hours. After such an insult, Garcia Moreno felt that there was nothing left for the government of Ecuador but to conquer or die. After an eloquent appeal to the patriotism of the people, and having unmasked the odious conduct of Franco, he hastened to put himself at the head of the troops. The soldiers, exasperated against Franco, and stirred to the highest pitch of enthusiasm by Garcia Moreno's thrilling words, started on the 20th of January to meet the enemy. Colonel Leon, one of Franco's officers, held a fortified position on the heights of Piscurco, but waited to make the attack till the reinforcements under Commandant Zirda arrived from Guayaquil. Garcia Moreno determined, therefore, to forestall him, and his troops made a furious charge, which the strength of the position alone rendered unsuccessful. Garcia Moreno then made a flank movement, leaving Colonel de Valos with several companies of infantry and a squadron of cavalry to continue the attack and mask his movements. This succeeded in a marvelous manner. All the enemy's ammunition and baggage fell into their hands, and the rout was complete. Colonel Leon, with the scattered remains of his troops, fled back to Guayaquil, while Garcia Moreno sent Colonel Madonado at the head of some picked men to meet Zerda and found him hastening from Cuenca to help Colonel Leon. The engagement took place in the plains of Sabin on the 7th of February, and so vigorous and unexpected was the attack that the victory was complete, and the greater number of the officers and men, including Zerda himself, fell into the hands of Maldonado. The latter took advantage of his success to march on Cuenca, which was defended by a small garrison under Colonel Araiza. 
but seeing his inferiority in numbers, Arosa capitulated without firing a shot. The inhabitants of Cuenca were overjoyed and could at last breathe freely and follow their own sympathies by uniting themselves to the government of Quito. There remained only the province of Loja, situated on the frontiers of Peru. The town of Loja had, with much hesitation, joined the party of Franco. But now, seeing Garcia Moreno's extraordinary success, were inclined to return to their old allegiance. It was a sort of calculating policy, and by reserving their act of submission, they hoped to be exonerated totally, or in part, from bearing their share of the public burdens. To cut short these interested conversations, Garcia Moreno went in person to Loja, and in two days succeeded in smoothing away all the difficulties so that the town submitted to its conditions amidst the acclamations of joy of the whole province. This series of brilliant maneuvers left only Guayaquil to General Franco, and even this province was devoted in heart to Garcia Moreno, though occupied by the troops of the usurper. After mature deliberation, it was decided that Garcia Moreno should return to his headquarters at Guaranda, and from thence descend the Cordilleras and fight a decisive battle with Franco and Castilla, feeling sure that a real and definitive peace could only be signed in the city of Guayaquil. The Taking of Guayaquil 1860. The admiration for Garcia Moreno went on increasing, and in the same degree, the hatred against Franco, who had just signed a treaty with Peru, which ceded a portion of Ecuador to the Peruvians, on condition that the latter should assist Franco in the defense of Guayaquil. The announcement of this infamous bargain was received with indignation by the whole country. A rich proprietor offered all his property to the Quito treasury to save the honor of his nation. Indignant protests were sent in from every province, and masses of young men came forward as volunteers to join the army. Before, however, risking this last appeal to arms, Garcia Moreno made another effort to save the blood of his people and wrote a beautiful letter to Franco suggesting that to avoid the horrible civil war in which they were engaged and to defeat the schemes of the common enemy both he and franco should resign their commands and retire into exile for a time while the province of guayaquil would join those of the interior in submitting to the provincial government at quito he concluded his letter with these words if you accept this proposal, which would ensure the integrity of our territory without wounding your honor, I will instantly send in my own resignation and leave the country. It would be with a bad grace that I should ask such a sacrifice at your hands if I were not ready to set you the example. Instead of being struck at this generous and patriotic proposal, Franco was furious at the very idea of abandoning the presidency, which he had so long coveted. He burst into the vilest abuse of Garcia Moreno, and even imprisoned the messenger who brought him the letter. As a last resource, Garcia Moreno addressed himself to the agent of the diplomatic corps, imploring their mediation, showing how the unhappy treaty entered into by Franco with Peru had widened the breach between Guayaquil and the provincial government of Quito, which never could consent to a measure so contrary to the rights, interests, and honor of the people of Ecuador. That there was no alternative between the abdication of Franco or a war of extermination, while he renewed the proposal he had already made, to retire into voluntary exile if Franco would do the same. He proposed also the election of a new chief of the state, chosen by both governments, adding, The country does not need any particular man, and the provincial government should be above the interests of party or personal ambition. This wonderful instance of self-abnegation and patriotism induced the diplomatic body to do their utmost to bring about a reconciliation which should avert the horrors of civil war. But Franco resisted all their efforts, and even demanded the expulsion of Garcia Moreno, 
whom he declared to be the author of all the evils which had fallen on Ecuador. On the 1st of May, the glorious anniversary of the Quito Revolution, his rage knew no bounds. From Babahoyo, Manabi, and other towns on the sea coast came petitions for union with the provisional government, together with a number of volunteers for Garcia's army. Franco tracked them with the greatest cruelty and chained them in his barracks, where many died under the lash. The noble initiative of the provisional government produced, however, a contrary effect on Castilla, who had sense enough to feel the moral victory which Garcia Marina had gained, not only among the people of Ecuador, but with the whole diplomatic body. Feeling that he was altogether in a false position, he gave orders to his troops to evacuate Guayaquil and return to Peru. He himself remained with a small portion of the squadron to watch the course of events and intervene with his cannons, if needful, to save the treaty of the 25th of January. The situation began to clear itself, and the forces of the two parties were becoming more equal when Garcia Marina received a reinforcement, as precious as it was unexpected, by arrival in the camp of Guaranda of old General Flores. After fifteen years of exile, the ex-president had settled in Peru with the consent of Castilla. The latter had summoned him to assist Franco in the war against Ecuador, and on his indignant refusal had driven him from Peru. Flores, in this moment of danger to his country, forgot his past misfortunes and resentments. Listening only to the voice of honor, he wrote to Garcia Marino, in the difficult circumstances in which you are placed, let me know if I can be of any use to you. If so, I am at your orders. Garcia Marino, forgetting all past and present rivalries, hastened to reply, Come immediately and be our general-in-chief. A few days later, these two political adversaries, United in the same patriotic feelings, embrace one another in face of the whole army, wild with joy and enthusiasm. Flores arrived at the very moment when his military talents and experience were most needed. A month later, Franco decided to steam up the river Guayas with his soldiers and cannons and establish himself at Babahoya, intending from thence to attack the provinces of the interior. The two chiefs at once decided that they would not give him time to climb the Cordilleras, but would meet him in the plain, where the population were groaning under his heavy yoke. But first, Garcia Marina put forth two brilliant proclamations, one to the inhabitants of Guayaquil and one to his army, which acted as an electric shock upon them both and filled his soldiers with confidence and courage. Our readers will understand the difficulties of this march on Guayaquil if they remember the configuration of the country which the army had to traverse. On leaving Guaranda, they were first met by the abrupt and precipitous slopes of the Cordilleras and would have to march through narrow and dangerous paths, which in some places were almost impracticable, and to drag after them all their baggage, ammunition, and artillery. When they had at last reached the plain, they would have to encounter Franco's army, superior not only in numbers, but in artillery and cavalry. If, beyond their hopes, they were victorious, Franco would only have to get on board his ships and return to Guayaquil, which they would then have regularly to besiege. But the military genius of Flores and the invincible courage of Garcia Marino triumphed over all these difficulties. Their only chance was in taking the enemy by surprise, avoiding a pitched battle, and only attacking when circumstances rendered it absolutely necessary. The enemy was divided into two corps, of which one, under Franco, occupied Babahoyo, a town situated at the foot of the Cordilleras, and connected by the river with Guayaquil. The other, under General Leon, occupied Catamaras, a village on the road to Ventamas, to the right of the river. 
To defeat this combination, Flores determined to turn the flank of Franco's army by attacking him in the rear, and that without giving the alert to General Leon. In order to mask his plan, he sent off a division to Belovin near Babahoyo, where under cover of this false attack, the main body of the army, by forced marches and unknown paths, crossed the mountains and arrived at Ventanas. On the 5th of August, at 6 o'clock in the evening, the greater portion had arrived safely, but in spite of incredible fatigues, they were obliged to go on at dead of night, and in complete silence, so as not to be detected by General Leon, whose camp was close by. Luckily, all the peasantry were devoted to Garcia Moreno and gave him the most minute and accurate information as to the movements of the enemy. As guides and even as sappers, they opened fresh paths across the forest with their axes when the ordinary road became dangerous. The troops marched in that way for sixteen mortal hours before reaching Bebohoyo. Their movements were, however, so rapid and so secret that they arrived without having fired off a single cartridge. At nine o'clock they attacked the town. Utterly taken by surprise, Franco and his soldiers could not resist the impetuous charge of the Quito troops. Still, the artillery poured a destructive fire upon them from their batteries until Flores ordered the cavalry to change the artillery men, who were cut down while still clinging to their guns. After that, the rout became general, and Franco, wounded in the shoulder, escaped with difficulty on board a ship to hide his defeat at Guayaquil. After three hours fighting, Garcia Moreno accordingly found himself master of Babahoyo, where a large number of officers and soldiers with cannons, guns, and ammunition, besides the printing press and salt mines of the government, fell into his hands. He wrote after this victory to the provisional government, I have kept my word and hope soon to be able to announce to you the end of this campaign, which has been visibly blessed by God. Then, with that forgetfulness of self, of which only great men are capable, he added, We owe these triumphs mainly to the genius of our general-in-chief and to the extraordinary military virtues and endurance of our officers and soldiers. The taking of Babahoyo had placed General Leon in a most critical position. He tried to escape by Zamboradin, hoping there to embark his troops and rejoin Franco at Guayaquil. But Flores, who guessed his movements, hastened to Baca Covina in front of Zamboradin with cannon and artillery to sink his ships if he attempted to escape by the river. General Leon was finally obliged to traverse the woods and marshes on foot before he could rejoin his chief, who was preparing a desperate last resistance at Guayaquil. As all the provinces had declared in favor of Garcia Moreno, Franco determined, together with Castilla, to declare Guayaquil a free town, apart from the rest of Ecuador, and under the protectorate of Peru. Such was the respect paid by these Democrats to the national will. It took a whole month for Garcia Moreno's army to arrive at the city and establish their camp at Mapasingue. There, he and Flores consulted as to the last dispositions to be taken before making the terrible assault. Guayaquil was defended on that side by a strongly fortified hill, bristling with batteries, which made it virtually impregnable. To the right of this natural fortress flows the river Guayas, which surrounds the town on that side, and the waters of which flow into the sea. To the left is what is called the Estero Salado, a kind of marsh planted with great mangrove trees, an arm of the sea, in fact, which completely isolates Guayaquil and the fine plain which surrounds it. Only by stratagem, therefore, could such a place be taken. For several days, Flores ostensibly prepared a regular assault of the hill and the fort which adjoined the Estero Salado, while Franco, on his side, disposed his batteries so as to annihilate them on the first attack. 
On the 22nd of September, in the evening, everyone went to rest, convinced that the assault would be made on the morrow. But in the middle of the night, while the fires brightened up the camp as usual, the whole of Flores's army, save a regiment of lancers and a company of artillerymen, who were left to defend the general's headquarters in case of attack, moved off to the borders of the fatal marsh, determined to cross it, and fall upon Guayaquil from the only side where Franco would never expect them, as the wildest imagination could never conceive that any soldiers would venture to cross this terrible swamp with cannons and artillery. After two hours' march, in perfect silence, the exhausted men threw themselves down for a little rest before affronting the dangers of the Estero Salado. This arm of the sea is divided into three parts. The first is a slimy, muddy marsh covered with mangroves, whose roots rise several yards above the soil, interlaced like a coat of mail, and forming an impenetrable hedge for five or six hundred yards. Beyond this, the marsh is intersected by a deep canal, thirty meters in width, which is called the Rio Salado. After that, the marsh begins again with the forest of mangroves up to the savannah. This was the threefold barrier which the troops had to cross before reaching Guayaquil. The general-in-chief, with some sharpshooters, was examining the passage when a fusillade from Salado proved that they were watched. Rushing forward to reconnoitre the enemy, they found that the shots came from some scouts, who, the instant they found their fire returned, took to their boats and made for the sea. The Rio being thus forced, the sharpshooters crossed it in barges and on rafts and established themselves on the opposite bank to protect the arduous passage of the troops, the cannon being likewise placed in position for the same purpose. Then began the struggle, the soldiers clinging to the branches of the mangroves covered with sticky mud and struggling for their lives amidst the roots and slime. Several battalions had crossed in safety, when a sharp fusillade burst forth from the Liza fort, and a detachment of the enemy were seen hurrying forward to bar the passage. Flores had foreseen this probability, and instantly, by his orders, twenty trumpets from the sharpshooters sounding a charge as if the whole army were advancing. Deceived by this clever ruse, the enemy, who were only two hundred strong, hastily retreated. In the meantime, the artillery had arrived on the banks of the terrible marsh, with their guns and gun carriages, their shells and their ammunition. Seeing their chief start forward, first with a powder cask weighing fifty kilos, the men followed him with an eagerness equal to his own. It is impossible to give an adequate idea of what their toil was for those eight hours, during which they had to drag over their cannon and ammunition by sheer strength and pluck against such fearful obstacles. At last, covered with slime from head to foot, with bleeding legs and feet, their uniforms and rags streaming with perspiration and dying of thirst, these poor fellows arrived on the plain with all their artillery, amidst the cheers of the whole army. Towards evening, when they had rested a little, Garcia Moreno and Flores formed them in a vast quadrilateral, extending all across the plain, and going up and down the ranks, gave them their last instructions. At eleven o'clock the clarion sounded the charge, that is, victory or death for there was no escape if they were defeated, with Franco's cannons before and the fearful marsh behind them. Soldiers and officers had but one thought, to defeat the rebels or sell their lives dearly. At that instant, Franco's batteries thundered forth, together with the cannons of the Peruvian steamer Tambez. Garcia Marino and his men answered by the cry of Hurrah for Ecuador and charged the advance guard of the enemy with such fury that they fell back in great disorder 
and were only brought again to the charge by a fresh attack from the battalion of Colonel Vitamilla. Commandant Barita succeeded at the same moment in dispersing a strong battalion of artillery and taking their guns. In the meantime, Flores's cannon swept across the plain, and with such effect that the Guayaquil troops, who never imagined that any cannon could cross the Salado, retired in disorder behind the batteries on the hill, abandoning their barrack and their park of artillery. The forts on the heights still held out. Garcia Marino and Flores gave the signal of a general attack at four o'clock. Colonel Ventimilla, under a terrible fire, carried the fortifications of Ligua by assault and took possession of the batteries. Towards six o'clock, the general in chief, surrounded by a feeble escort, approached the Cerro entrenchments to entreat the enemy not to prolong a useless resistance, when a furious mulatto, brandishing his lance, threw himself on the speaker. Flores had barely a second in which to turn and fly, being followed by a shower of balls from which he only escaped by miracle. A few minutes after he came back at the head of the Avengers of Quito, as his picked band were called, who dashed up the parapet, killed the artillerymen, and spiked their guns, so that they became masters not only of Cerro, but of all the batteries from Legua to the military hospital. From that instant, the enemy fled in the greatest confusion through the streets of the city, hiding when they could in the houses, from whence they fired on the conquerors. At nine o'clock, the few survivors of this terrible, bloody struggle were all made prisoners, and Franco, flying from his conquerors on board a Peruvian ship, left behind him four hundred men, the greater part of his officers, twenty-six pieces of artillery, and all his arms and ammunition. After this brilliant victory, Garcia Marina addressed his comrades as follows. Masters of the stronghold, where the savage chief of the Taras has so long taken refuge, you have crowned yourselves with laurels which will not fade. The passage of the Salado with your cannons and the fights which have assured our triumph will ever remain as memorable and heroic facts in the military history of nations. The taking of Guayaquil, which put an end to a 15-month struggle, was hailed with acclamations of joy throughout Ecuador. To give extra significance to this event and perpetuate its remembrance, Garcia Marina willed that the national flag, which Franco had so dishonored, should be changed. This flag he wrote in a solemn decree, which has been stained by a chief unworthy of the name, must give place to the old one, die with the blood of our bravest men, the glory of which is immaculate. From today, the noble old Colombian flag shall become once more the banner of the Republic. But as an earnest and devout Christian, Garcia Marina did not forget the victory must be attributed less to man's genius than to the intervention of God's providence. The taking of Guayaquil, having taken place on September 24th, 1860, the Feast of Our Lady of Mercy, he decreed that in gratitude to the Mother of our Divine Redeemer, and to deserve her assistance in future, the Army of the Republic should be placed henceforth under the special protection of Our Lady of Mercy and that at each anniversary both the government and the army should assist officially at the great solemnities of the church. In truth, Our Lady of Mercy, the Redemptress of captives, had helped him to deliver his people from men more to be feared than the Saracens, that is, the agents of socialism and revolution. Garcia Marino, President, 1860-1861 during the last 15 years, we have admired Garcia Marino as a patriot and head of the opposition, determined to deliver his country from the tyrants who oppressed her. We have now to follow him and his government of the country he had saved. The problems he had to solve appeared almost hopelessly difficult. Ecuador had to be brought once more under the guidance of the church. 
but how? All were imbued with modern ideas. The liberals consider that the church should be subject to the state. The radicals and Freemasons that she was an enemy who must be destroyed. Even good Catholics hesitated between the inalienable rights of the church and the pretended rights of the people. These discordant elements, it is true, have been united at a moment of common danger, but once the critical time was passed, the coalition became almost impossible. Garcia Moreno had also to face the violent opposition of the defeated party and of those numerous followers of Urbina, Robles, and Franco, who still remained in the civil and military departments of the state. Garcia Moreno was then only the head of a provisional government. His first business was to call together the chambers, which were to give the country both a new constitution and a president. Now, in a republic, the electoral question is of primary importance. It is a signal folly which some people hold as a theory that the government should keep itself aloof from elections. It is to abandon the people to the intrigues of villains who may flatter and deceive them one day while they trouble them under their feet the next. As things then were, Garcia Moreno's only chance was to reform the whole electoral system. Under the Spanish dominion, Ecuador was divided into three great districts, Quito, Cuenca, and Guayaquil. Each was to send ten deputies to the convention, so that Guayaquil and Cuenca could always checkmate the Quito deputies, who were mostly conservatives, although the population of the latter province was three times as great. Hence arose the anomaly of a Catholic people being almost always represented by liberals or ultra-radicals. Garcia Marina determined to destroy the root of the evil by fixing the number of deputies according to the population of each province. Every 20,000 souls would thus have a right to a representative in the chambers. This dealt a mortal blow to the revolutionary supremacy. The radicals understood this so well that they organized a formidable opposition to the new electoral law under the direction of Pedro Carbo, who had been created governor of Guayaquil. Garcia Moreno answered him by a magnificent letter, in which he exposed the fallacy of the old system and the absolute necessity for its revision. But he went further still. In order to destroy the oligarchy of the great towns, where a certain number of rich men and radicals influenced all the electors, he issued the following decree. The election will be based on the numbers of the population. Each fraction of 20,000 inhabitants will elect a deputy. The election will be direct and the suffrage universal. Every citizen of 21 years of age who can read and write will be qualified to vote. The rage of the radicals knew no bounds, but the people flocked joyfully to the urns, too happy to give worthy colleagues to the man who had saved them, so that the conservative victory was complete. The radicals resorted to their usual methods of revenge, sedition, and the dagger. Three days later, an odious conspiracy was discovered to assassinate Garcia Moreno and proclaim Pedro Carbo as president, and it was only by being unexpectedly summoned to Quito that Garcia Moreno escaped. The convention met, and never was it composed of more heterogeneous elements. First appeared General Flores, whose noble conduct in the last struggle had effaced the recollection of the past. Garcia Moreno, his old enemy, would only see in him the brave soldier who had conquered the enemies of his country, and he was named President of the Congress. Around him were grouped certain notabilities of the conservative and Catholic party, and even some members of the clergy. But there are different shades both of conservative and Catholics in these days, and many of these very men had their heads riled with utopian notions as to the separation of church and state, the federative system, and other theories which were popular in New Granada and elsewhere. After the opening sitting on January 10, 1861, the provisional government gave a succinct account of their proceedings during the last 15 months and resigned their powers. 
The report of their proceedings during that time was received with tremendous cheers and applause. It was at once decreed that the members of the provisional government had deserved well of their country, and that the bust of these three great citizens should be placed in the government palace to perpetuate the remembrance of their glorious services. Garcia Moreno was the most warmly congratulated and appointed president ad interim. His decree declaring the Blessed Virgin the special protectress of the Republic was confirmed, and special thanks were voted to the army, which by its bravery had saved the Republic. But the such a unanimity ceased when it became a question of the revision of the Constitution. Garcia Marina earnestly desired that to Ecuador should be granted a purely Catholic Constitution, but finding it impossible to develop his whole plan at once, he contented himself with setting aside, for the moment, all that paralyzed the action of the Church. The first proposition declared that the Holy, Roman, Apostolic, and Catholic Church was the religion of the state to the exclusion of all others. This was no innovation, as it had been always admitted in the Republic. But the wind blew from another quarter at that moment. Everyone was in favor of liberty of worship, liberty of conscience, modern progress, and the like. A noted ecclesiastic even ventured to make a speech of Mirabios, declaring that God, being as visible as the sun, an official recognition of his power was a superfluity. Fortunately, these ridiculous declarations roused the whole country against the speaker. Garcia Moreno used all his influence to bring back the younger deputies to more healthy ideas, and in the end, the article was maintained. Another burning question was the federal system. Should Ecuador preserve her unity or be divided into small independent states like Switzerland? Garcia Moreno vigorously opposed the division, proving that it would result in a bitter antagonism which would end in a civil war and destroy the resources of a country which had a small population though an immense extent of territory. After a very stormy debate, he carried this point, also by a large majority. The only remaining subject of discussion was as to the extent of the executive power. Garcia Marina contented himself with asking, first, for the ratification of his electoral reform, and then the division of the province of Guayaquil into two, so as to withdraw the plain from the disastrous influence of the city. These two measures were agreed to, and the Constitution was voted. The election of a president then became the order of the day. By a unanimous vote, Garcia Marina was elected, and thus the whole nation, by its representatives, did justice to the great citizen, who for the last fifteen years had labored solely for the honor and good of his country. At first Garcia Marina refused the honor, alleging the insufficiency of the powers accorded to the government by the new constitution. He ended by yielding to the entreaties of his friends, who saw in him the only man capable of regenerating the nation, and so made an appeal to his conscience and his devotedness. To prove their goodwill, the deputies hastened to vote certain organic laws, of which they perhaps did not see all the bearings. They decided that a concordat should be proposed to the sovereign pontiff and be carried into execution without waiting for the ratification of a future congress. By this door, the new president hoped by degrees to pass all the measures necessary for the liberty of the church. They also decreed the reorganization of the finances of the army and of public education. Besides, the construction of a carriage road between Quito and Guayaquil. Garcia Marino, whose extraordinary activity and genius were well known, received the mission to carry out this magnificent program. They were, in fact, his own plans, and in passing them the deputies were only following out his inspirations. But no one guessed at the colossal proportions he was about to give them. In fact, in spite of the hostile elements of which the chambers were composed, 
Garcia Moreno had contrived to set aside all laws contrary to the interests of the church or the state and obtain carte blanche to carry out his much wished for reforms. This was, at starting, a wonderful success. Reforms, 1861 Garcia Moreno set to work immediately to clear out this Augean stable in a country where revolution had reigned supreme for a quarter of a century. The specialty of all revolutionary governments is to consume without producing, not to help the people to live, but to live at their expense. The first thing they do is to lay hold of the property of the church and to drive away every honest man from the administration. Then their followers fill all the vacant places and fatten themselves upon the ruin of the nation, which wakes up, after a time, to find itself without religion, without honor or credit, without money, and with bankruptcy at its gates. To console the people they talk of progress and liberty. Such was the miserable state to which the revolutionary party had brought Ecuador when Garcia Moreno took the reins of power. His first care was to make an entire change in the public functionaries, and to take in only men of proved honesty, who were capable of carrying out his great designs. He insisted also on strict regularity and laborious work, in all those under him, of which he was the first to set an example. The financial state of the country was deplorable. Money had been recklessly borrowed until no more could be raised, while the people were crushed under the weight of an exorbitant taxation. No accounts had been kept, and there was not even an attempt made to control the expeditor. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, under Robles, had conducted a report on the budget of 1857 with the words, I have undeniable proofs that the national finances are in a state of perfect chaos, which makes it impossible for me to render any trustworthy accounts to the House, and that is the only result I have arrived at after months of fruitless toil. Garcia Moreno, however, was determined to sift the whole matter to the bottom, and devoted himself to the terrible task of verifying all the debts contracted by the Republic during the last twenty years the forced loans, which had been raised again and again without any record being kept, and all the iniquitous fiscal proceedings, which had resulted in a debt of four million of piastres. Having at last mastered this part of the subject, he introduced the French system of bookkeeping, with a clear account of the exports and imports, and with a board of control to check any frauds in the executive body. Next came the turn of the stock jobbers and gamblers in the funds, many of whom were made to disgorge their ill-gotten gains, while the public functionaries who were convicted of sharing in this nefarious traffic were indignantly dismissed. Garcia Moreno gave himself a noble example of disinterestedness, though he had little or no private fortune. He never would touch the twelve thousand piastres which was the annual salary voted for the president. He remitted one half of it to the exchequer, and the other half to the public charities. A still more urgent reform was that of the army. Since the revolutionary party had been in power, the soldiers virtually disposed of everything, as each president owed his power to the bayonets of these men, without shame or honor, who affected a supreme contempt for the civil power. No sooner was Garcia Moreno elected president than he determined to put a stop to this state of things. An army thus constituted, he exclaimed, is a cancer which eats out the very heart of a people. Either I will reform or I will destroy it. He set to work at once, issuing stringent regulations against the nightly sorties, the immorality, and the brigandage of the troops and throwing into prison all who disobeyed them, whether officers or men. General Araza, who after the capitulation of Cuenca had retired to Quito, organized a kind of mutiny against the new military regulations. Garcia had him seized, carried off to the barracks, and punished as a private soldier. This severity had the desired effect. 
army discipline was once more restored, and the troops became a protection instead of a terror to the whole country. Once in possession of this triple element of action, a body of devoted and honorable officials as his colleagues, the finances of the country placed on a sound basis, and a military force sufficiently disciplined to maintain peace at home and abroad, he determined to establish that Christian civilization which he coveted for his country, and which he rightly considered to be the essential condition of true progress, whether material, intellectual, or moral. The foundation of all regeneration rests on public education, which, by molding the hearts and minds of children, prepares the future of society. The revolutionists and Freemasons know this so well, that the first thing they do in every country, as soon as they get into power, is to lay aside the schools, that is, to deprive them of all moral and religious instruction. This diabolical idea which pervades all Europe at this moment had its origin in America. Garcia Moreno, as rector of the university, had perpetually urged the necessity of reform in this matter, but had not yet been able to realize it. Now the moment was come to lay the first stone, at any rate, of this great work. He made his first appeal, in 1861, to the devotion of the French congregations, among whom workmen and workwomen are always to be found, ready to labor in Christ's vineyard, whether under tropical suns or arctic snows. Bands of Christian brothers, sisters of charity, and religious of the Sacred Heart, hastened, in answer to his appeal, to open primary schools and educational establishments in all the great centers of Ecuador. The Jesuits, whom he had defended with such courage, were instantly recalled and installed in their old house of St. Louis in Quito, and then in a second establishment, from whence other professors were sent to found new colleges in Guayaquil and Cuenca. The rage of the liberals knew no bounds, and reached its height when Garcia Moreno entrusted the hospitals and prisons to sisters and brothers of charity, dismissing the lay nurses and warders whom the revolution had placed there, while the administration of these establishments was entrusted to men animated with a like spirit to his own. At the same time he began a work which no one had as yet thought of attempting namely, the creation of carriage roads all across Ecuador, so as to open up communications between the towns and the ports of the Pacific. Everyone declared the idea to be utopian, and impossible of realization. Garcia Moreno, without listening to any of the grumblers, drew out a plan for the high road from Quito to Guayaquil, and carried it out in spite of all the obstacles which ignorance, idleness, and cupidity threw in his way. He undertook similar works from this time till his death, and the enormous commercial, industrial, and agricultural benefits thus conferred on Ecuador would be enough to immortalize him as president, even had he no other claim on the gratitude of his countrymen. The Concordat, 1862 our readers will not have forgotten what we have before said as to the origin of ecclesiastical patronage in Ecuador. The kings of Spain had obtained numberless privileges from the sovereign pontiffs, relating to ecclesiastical questions and the appointment of bishops. This was all very well as long as these privileges were exerted by Catholic princes who had at heart the good of the people and the maintenance of the church. But it was quite another thing when such powers fell into the hands of the revolutionists, who were determined to form a national church and to substitute the civil power for that of the Pope, to establish, in fact, the supremacy of the state over the church. This Masonic dogma was detestable to Garcia Moreno, and feeling with St. Anselm that God loves nothing better than the liberty of his church, he resolved to snap asunder the chains which had so long bound her. To do this, he had obtained from Congress authority to conclude a concordat with the Holy See. His first care now was to choose a man who could undertake this difficult and delicate mission. For not long before, the minister Buenos Aires, having insisted on inserting in his concordat a clause in favor of liberty of worship, 
Pius IX had broken off the negotiations. Garcia Moreno chose a priest still young, but whose ideas and intentions harmonized with his own. D. Ignacio Ordonez, then Archdeacon of Cuenca. Footnote. D. Ignacio was always honored by Garcia Moreno's affection and confidence, which both his talents and virtues well deserved. As senator, he warmly defended the church and the congress. As bishop of Riobamba, he spent all his revenues in the works necessary for his new diocese. When exiled by the revolutionists who put Garcia Moreno to death, he passed several years in France and gave up his see with wonderful disinterestedness. When peace was once more re-established, Leo XIII promoted him to the Archiepiscopal See of Quito and insisted upon his acceptance of the dignity which the humble prelate considered to be a burden far beyond his strength. May God grant that, for the interest of the Church in Ecuador, a long life may be granted to this holy and excellent man, who was the constant friend and faithful auxiliary of Garcia Moreno. End footnote. Having been sent to France towards the end of the year 1861 with a commission to bring back the brothers and sisters for the primary schools, D. Ignacio pushed on to Rome. There he received from his government, to his great surprise, an official missive appointing him minister plenipotentiary from Ecuador to the Holy See, so as to arrange the proposed concordat. His first idea was to refuse the honor for which he thought himself insufficient. But Pius IX reassured him by these words full of goodness and wisdom. As a priest, you must know the rights of the Church, as an inhabitant of Ecuador, the needs of your country. Besides, you are furnished with minute instructions from your president. What do you wish for more? And he added with his fine smile, Must a man be a Metternich to treat with Pius IX? One may add that it was still less difficult to treat with Garcia Moreno. This great statesman gave the following simple but sublime instruction to his envoy. I wish for the complete liberty of the church and the complete reform also of the secular and regular clergy. I entreat the sovereign pontiff to send us a nuncio invested with supreme power to enforce these reforms upon all. After six months' discussion, the plan of the Concordat, called a referendum, was signed on September 26, 1862, by Cardinal Antonelli, Prime Minister, and by D. Ignacio Ordonez, plenipotentiary of Ecuador. This is its substance. The Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman religion is the religion of the state, to the exclusion of all other form of worship, and of all societies condemned by the Church. It will be preserved perpetually in its integrity, with all its rights and prerogatives, conformably to the order established by God and to canon law. Education in every branch will be modeled on the principles of the Catholic Church. The bishops alone will have the right to decide on the books which shall be made use of by the students for the teaching of ecclesiastical science, and of those which regard faith or morals. Further than this, they will exercise their right with full liberty to prescribe and prohibit all books contrary to religion or morals. The government also will take all the necessary measures to prevent the introduction of such books into the Republic. As to the university, the colleges and the primary schools, the bishops, who are invested by God with the right to watch over all matters of doctrine and morals, will have the authoritative inspection of them all. The sovereign pontiff, having jurisdiction over the whole church, both the bishops and faithful may communicate freely with him without either his letters or the pontifical rescripts being submitted to the exquator of the civil powers. The bishops will have full liberty in the administration of their respective dioceses, as also in convocation or in the holding of provincial or diocesan synods. The Church will exercise, without let or hindrance, full power to possess and administer her property. Ecclesiastical tribunals will be re-established in their integrity. The cases of clerics will be dealt with by ecclesiastical authority, without any appeal to secular tribunals. 
appeals are abuses, which are and must remain suppressed. The Church grants to the President of the Republic the right of presentation to vacant bishoprics. The bishops will select and submit three candidates to the President, out of whom he must make his choice, and that within three months. After that time, the nomination will lapse to the Holy See. Footnote. See the text of the Concordat in El National of April 22, 1863. End footnote. After one or two clauses relating to the special needs of Ecuador, the Concordat concludes with this last article. The law of patronage is and will remain suppressed. The articles of the Concordat being thus determined, an exchange of signatures was to take place at Quito, and Pius IX sent an apostolic delegate to represent the Holy See. This prelate, Monsignor Tavani, was the bearer of an autographed letter from His Holiness to congratulate Garcia Moreno on his profound piety towards the Holy See and his ardent zeal for the interests of the Catholic Church, exhorting him to favor the full liberty of this daughter of Christ as well as the diffusion of his divine teaching, on which alone the peace and happiness of a people depended. This concordat, continued Monsignor Tavani, will furnish the world a new proof of Catholic unity, of the mutual support lent by the sword to the tiara, and of the indestructible links which unite the eternal city of Rome and the Republic of Ecuador. Garcia Marina's love for the holy and good Pius IX knew no bounds, and also his indignation at the persecution he was then enduring from Garibaldi and his followers. He made a magnificent speech in this sense to the papal nuncio, who duly transmitted it to the Holy Father. Soon after, Don Ignacio Ordonez arrived, bearing the projected concordat. The president accepted all the conditions but before appending his signature, he inquired if the clauses had been inserted with regard to the reform of the clergy. Now on this question there had been some difference of opinion. Garcia Moreno had begged that a pontifical delegate might be sent with full powers to make the delinquents return to their duties, and to those among the religious who resisted reform, he admitted of no alternative but secularization. This idea displeased the authorities at Rome, and the Holy Father sent word that though he was as anxious as Garcia Marina himself for reform, he thought it could be brought about by gentleness and persuasion. But this would have upset all the President's hopes. He knew too well the state of the religious houses in Ecuador, and that without vigorous measures the Concordat would remain a dead letter. Return immediately to Rome, he exclaimed to his minister and tell the Pope that I accept all the articles of the Concordat, but on condition that he also should impose the reform of the clergy. If he will not do this, I cannot impose the Concordat. Don Ignacio set off immediately and reappeared before Pius IX, who was stupefied at his prompt and unexpected return. Doubtless, exclaimed the Pope, you come to say to me like Caesar, Vene vidi vici. On the contrary, I come to announce to your holiness that the president refused to sign the concordat, and as Pius IX showed immense astonishment, Don Ignacio explained that if they had taken count of Garcia Marina's instructions concerning the liberty of the church, they had omitted his propositions regarding the reform of the clergy. I wish for the reform, replied the Pope, but not by the same means. But he affirms, replied the minister, that if your holiness knew the situation as well as he does, you would see clearly that the means he proposes are the only efficacious means. In fact, without this reform, and that an immediate one, the execution of the concordat is impossible. Pius IX knew by his own experience the difficulty of bringing about reforms by persuasion alone even though backed by the highest authority. His scruples, consequently, disappeared before the conscientious energy of the inflexible president, and he at once decided that plenary powers should be granted to the apostolic delegates. 
A month later, on April 22, 1863, all obstacles having been removed, the Concordat was solemnly promulgated in the capital and in all the towns of Ecuador. At Quito, the ceremony was performed in the Metropolitan Church with all the pomp and dignity befitting so historical an event. After the Pontifical Mass, the President and the Papal Delegate, surrounded by all the civil and military authorities, proceeded to the exchange of signatures, after which the articles of the Concorda were read out to the people. Then, while they all intoned the Te Deum, and amidst salvos of artillery, the Ecuador flag and that of the Holy Father were simultaneously hoisted to symbolize before every one the closed union which was henceforth to exist between the church and the state. By this act of Christian policy, an act without parallel in the history of modern nations, Garcia Moreno raised himself above all statesmen since the days of St. Louis. Alone among sovereigns, he understood what was needed for the reform of human society, and alone, in spite of the radical and socialist elements which are the destruction of both people and things, he restored true liberty to his country by placing her once more under the government of God. The Regeneration of the Clergy, 1862-1863 Garcia Moreno had so much at heart the regeneration of the clergy that no sooner was the Concordat signed at Rome then he begged the archbishop to fix a day for the opening of the national council which was to take cognizance of the laws of the concordat and see if they were carried into execution the old archbishop of quito monsignor riofrio a good but timid man issued the letters of convocation and announced that the council would meet on the second sunday of january eighteen sixty three provided that by that day the concordat had been signed. The patronage law remained in force until the promulgation of the concordat, and the archbishop did not dare open the session without the usual placket. Garcia Moreno, however, insisted on the council being opened, taking upon himself the sole responsibility of the act. The consequences were what the archbishop had foreseen, namely, that the fiscal procurator summoned all the bishops before the High Court of Justice as having broken the law. Garcia Moreno told the archbishop to go on without taking any notice of the summons, and himself sent for the procurator, to whom he addressed the following words. You have drawn up an act of accusation against the bishops, and incurred, in consequence, as a Catholic, a double excommunication, first for having violated the liberties of the church, and next for striving to drag the ministers of God before a civil tribunal. But your responsibility does not rest there. As head of the state, I am compelled to enforce the Constitution, and the first article in that Constitution declares that the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman faith is the religion of the state, which everyone must respect. You wish to condemn the bishops to exile for having violated a schismatical law. I condemn you to the like punishment for having outraged the Constitution by persecuting the religion of the state. The frightened official protested that so far from having meditated an attack on religion, he had thought it was his duty simply to carry out the existing laws and at once withdrew the act of accusation, out of deference for the wishes of the President. The Council continued its conferences on the reform of the secular and regular clergy. Garcia Moreno encouraged them in every possible way. Be assured, he said, that I will support you in every way, and cause your sentences to be carried into effect, but it is your province to judge and punish the guilty. The poor archbishop expressed his fears of the consequences of repressing such gross abuses as they had discovered. What does it signify? the president exclaimed. We must be ready to sacrifice our lives, if God wills, for the honor of his church. I will not suffer anyone to fail on his duty. The re-establishment of the ecclesiastical tribunals facilitated these measures of reform. 
one wretched priest having contrived to escape after having scandalized the public by the most awful crimes garcia marina offered a reward of five hundred piastres out of his own pocket to anyone in the kingdom who would deliver him up to the authorities on another occasion the judge hesitated to condemn a man whose infamous conduct was well known choose one of two things garcia marina exclaimed either you will punish him or i shall be forced to take measures myself to bring him to justice i cannot allow such sins to remain unchastised this wholesome severity produced a notable amelioration in the clergy but still more good was done by the creation of several new bishoprics in the first years of his priesthood pius the ninth had been in south america and had been much struck at the immense extent of the different states the difficulties of communication between them and the necessity of creating new dioceses to meet the wants of souls speaking to the ecuador plenipotentiary he has said your zealous president wishes to regenerate his country tell him that to succeed he must plant the cross wherever a cross is planted people group round it even were it on the heights of chimborazo your dioceses are too large for any single man to administer them properly we are going to create three new bishoprics and will mention this in the concordat you have no power in this matter but i know garcia marino tell him that the pope wishes it and that will be enough in fact no sooner had he received this message which went even beyond his hopes then Garcia Marino summoned his ministers and said to them with emotion, God himself has suggested this idea to us by his vicar. We must carry it out without delay. The municipalities of Ibarra, Riobamba, and Loja, the centers of the proposed new bishoprics, answered by addresses of congratulation and gratitude, and Garcia Marino, who never let anything rest, sent off a topographical plan at once to the pope with the limits of the new dioceses begging him immediately to sign the requisite bulls for the election of the bishops finally six were created and a seventh in eighteen seventy thought of porto viejo and the province of manabi to these great benefits the concordat added another which was the foundation of seminaries in each diocese and the power of nominating to cures and benefices without the interference of the civil power there only remained the most difficult task of all the reform of the regular clergy the revolution had forced the monasteries to receive superiors chosen by the government had turned their convents into barracks and driven the monks out of their cells to live in the world in defiance of all rules and of all the habits and safeguards of the religious life the pontifical delegate was invested with full powers to enforce regular observance among the monks and to restore community life with the three monastic virtues of chastity poverty and obedience of course this did not all suit a good number of these men who had fallen into worldly and dissolute habits and who had completely lost the spirit of their state the delegate gave them no choice, however, between submission and secularization. They multiplied their remonstrances and protestations, but in vain, for behind the papal envoy was the iron hand of Garcia Marino. The greater part of them preferred secularization to reform. Many emigrated to Peru and New Granada, others were incorporated with the secular clergy while those who had been all along faithful to their vocation were too glad to renew their old fervor in company with a certain number of religious whom garcia marino had imported from europe to restore the monastic spirit and replace the deserters all good catholics rejoiced in this real regeneration of the church but a concert of maledictions was raised against the reformer by the radicals and complaints of intolerance cruelty absolutism and the like were heard on all sides garcia marino let them talk as much as they pleased but went steadily on with his work he knew saint gregory the eighth had died in exile because he had loved justice and hated iniquity 
St. Charles Borromeo was nearly poisoned by those whom he had tried to reform. Inflexible when it was a question of duty, Garcia Moreno would have confronted a thousand deaths rather than draw back a step before the clamors or menaces of his enemies. The Defeat of Tolkien, 1862 Towards the middle of 1862, civil war broke out in New Granada between the radicals under General Mosquera and the President Arboleda, who was at the head of the conservative party. This last, who was descended from a family of heroes, resembled Garcia Moreno in many ways, being not only a brave warrior and a brilliant orator, but an ardent Catholic. He had been lately elected president when Mosquera took up arms against him seized Bogota, and declared open war against the church. Arboleda, having retired to the province of Cania, organized a resistance among that fervent Catholic population, in which he was warmly seconded by Garcia Moreno, till an unfortunate accident brought about a misunderstanding between these two men, who were so fitted to appreciate each other. On June 19, 1862, a battalion of Arboleda's while pursuing one of Mosquera's bands, crossed the frontier of Ecuador and attacked the garrison, badly wounding its commander. Garcia Moreno wrote an indignant remonstrance to Arboleda, insisting on an apology and the degradation of Colonel Eraza, the head of the expedition. Arboleda, pleading extenuating circumstances, and refused the required satisfaction. Garcia Moreno, who considered this act as a violation of the territory of Ecuador, determined himself to go to the frontier and personally to exact reparation from Arboleda. It required all his energy to take such a resolve at that moment. A short time before, while directing some workmen who were cutting a road across the forest, he had made a bad wound in his leg. In spite of medical care, the wound became so envenomed that absolute rest was ordered by the doctors. Yet, at that very moment, he was determined to ride to the frontier. Thoroughly experienced himself in surgery, he proposed to have the wound burnt, but the medical men thought the operation too dangerous and would not undertake it. Then Garcia Moreno, impatient of delay, seized a blade of iron, heated to a white heat, and put it on the open wound with as much calmness as if he had been operating on a bit of wood. Three days after, the wound being completely cicatrized, he made the journey to Carchi, which was a three days ride from Quito, and rejoined his little army. He had no intention of fighting, however, but solely of forcing Arruleta to consent to an interview, which he thought would settle the matter amicably. He sent, therefore, a messenger to arrange the meeting, to which Arboleda seemed anxious to agree. But in the meanwhile, by a ruse unworthy of a brave and loyal man, he crossed the frontier with 3,500 well-armed men and surprised Garcia Moreno with his 800 recruits in a disadvantageous position near Tolkien. There was no possibility of drawing back. The little body of troops defended itself heroically against trouble their number, but at last had no alternative but to capitulation or death. Garcia Moreno, with five men as brave as himself, dashed into the midst of the enemy's ranks, regardless of the balls which fell on every side, one of which would have pierced his chest, but was turned by a silver medal he always wore on his breast. Three men of giant size attacked him at once. Two he laid low with his lance. As the third was about to strike him, he cried out loud, Pierce him! The man, thinking he was being attacked from behind, turned round instinctively and was in an instant transfixed by Garcia Moreno. He seemed, in fact, to defy death. At last, surrounded on all sides by the enemy, who summoned him to surrender, he exclaimed, Lead me to your chief. To him alone will I yield my sword. Ashamed of his easy victory, Arboleda was thoroughly disconcerted in presence of his prisoner, whose magnanimous conduct condemned his own duplicity. 
he could only help declaring in presence of all his officers that such a defeat was honorable to Ecuador, and that his noble head had covered himself with glory. He treated Garcia Moreno with the greatest respect, restored to him both his sword and his liberty, and was only anxious to treat at once the conditions of peace. Sincerely reconciled from the moment they met, these two great Catholic chiefs only deplored the circumstances which had led them into the fratricidal combat, instead of uniting to turn their army against the common enemy. That tyrannical revolution which ravaged New Granada and never ceased intriguing in Ecuador to try and get back the power it had usurped. Forgetting their mutual griefs, they concluded a treaty of close alliance, and then Garcia Moreno returned to his capital. At Quito, in the meanwhile, there was nothing but trouble and agitation. The news of the defeat and captivity of Garcia Moreno was in everyone's mouth. While his friends mourned and lamented over this disastrous affair, his enemies were rejoiced and thought it would be an excellent opportunity to get rid of this tyrannical reformer who would impose such retrograde ideas on Ecuador. The organizers of this kind of pronunciamento were, however, grievously mistaken. Just as they were beginning to organize themselves, they heard that the president, so far from being a prisoner, was in his palace as usual, and that he had concluded an admirable treaty with Arboleda, as an addition to the one of 1837, by which the inviolability of the territory of both states was assured, together with a refusal to allow refugees to trouble the peace of either country, while great regret was expressed on both sides for the circumstances which had caused a temporary rupture. Arboleda, in fact, did his best to make amends for his treacherous attack by taking no advantage of his victory, but he could not repair his imprudence, and having yielded his position against Mosquera for the satisfaction of his vanity, beaten by his own rival and betrayed by his own people, he was finally assassinated a few months later, in the denies of Bararecos, on the same spot as the unfortunate Marshal Sucre. As to Garcia Moreno, his enemies did not fail to take advantage of his defeat at Tolkien, without however succeeding in eclipsing his glory in the unequal struggle. The want of success was forgotten in the heroism of the president. There was no dishonor, people exclaimed, in losing a battle under such conditions. And the defeat of the Merplier did not tarnish the fame of either Sparta or Leonidas.